delighted that you all uh, have come, and we thank you for this time of uh, reflection and work. Yesterday, we, I began with uh, reflections on, the, on uh, the first article of Barman. Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to trust, we have to hear, trust, and obey in life and in death. And yesterday I talked about how certain events, powers, figures, and truths were vying for recognition and acknowledgement in 1934 as sources of revelation apart from and besides this one word of God. I talked about how certain understandings of nature, history, and experience were proclaimed as decisive, definitive, and incontrovertible truths of our being, apart from and besides this one word of God. And why the church, the confessing church at least, rejected them as such. It rejected them as such, apart from and besides this one word of God, because they constituted competing standards of authority. The point of Barman's first article is Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is not just one truth among others. He is the truth, the standard by which all others are measured. Of course, this raises many questions, not least of which is, if Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God, the truth, what is the relationship between him and other truths? It's a big question, and uh, I can't begin to answer it adequately this morning with the academic precision that some of you may wish. Uh, and, but yesterday I said I'd deal with it, and uh, I shouldn't have said that perhaps. Uh, but uh, let me begin by responding. Uh, first to a concern I suspect some of you may have. So long as we define truth simply as that which corresponds to reality, talking about truth is fairly easy. It's easy until we're asked, what do you mean by reality? What do you mean by correspond? Some of you may have noticed yesterday that I did not elaborate a general theory, a coherence or correspondence theory of truth or any abstract philosophical theory of truth. Some of you may have been disappointed. I suspect most of you were relieved. <laughs> Yet some of you may wonder, how will people ever believe in Jesus Christ as the truth if they don't even believe that there is such a thing as truth. I recognize this concern and think the Bible does as well, but the Bible doesn't address this concern abstractly. Few scenes, few scenes in the Bible are full of richer irony than when Pontius Pilate stands before Jesus and asks, what is truth? It's rich because John's gospel repeatedly refers to Jesus as the truth. But it's also rich because of the one who's asking the question. It's a Roman. <laughs> Since when have Romans been interested in truth? Oh, they're famous for being warriors and architects and builders, but they're thinking about the truth? Yet Pilate asks about truth. And he can't recognize the truth even when it is standing in front of him, talking to him. When it comes to truth, the Bible knows our preference for abstraction. Uh, like the woman at the well, instead of answering Jesus' question, she preferred to discuss a general religious question. Oh, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. I'm not so sure people have really changed so much in this regard. It's been said if given the choice between having the truth or the quest for the truth, modern people tend to prefer the quest. 
The reason it's said is because modern people are more skeptical, skeptical about having the truth. They don't think truth is so haveable. But another reason is that claiming to know the truth places demands on us. Once you claim there's such a thing as truth, you're accountable to it. You've admitted there's a standard which uh, people ought to recognize. But that's why talking about truth is so dangerous. I'm not so sure modern people are more skeptical about truth. Uh, many before Pilate asked, what is truth? And many ask about it today. I don't know what you tell them. Uh, I suspect some of you have discovered that adding adjectives like absolute or objective doesn't usually help much. I know some of you have encountered others, uh, some who are quite agnostic about truth. Uh, I know some of you have encountered others who are not. Uh, nihilists who claim we can't know the truth. And when you ask, is that true? Uh, or uh, relativ relativists who say there are no absolutes, and you say, hmm, that sounds like a pretty absolute statement. Um, it's easy to point out the inconsistency uh, and futility of thinking of those who Paul says suppress the truth. But suppression is real uh, at the psychological level, let alone at the spiritual, even more so. It's real, it's deep and profound such that Scripture teaches that people really do not know the truth. In fact, some don't even know their right hand from their left, according to Scripture. Nihilists and relativists certainly exist among us. But most in our culture today do not deny there is such a thing as truth. Even on most university campuses today, most do not deny that there is such a thing as truth, contrary to what you may have heard. Most affirm there is such a thing. There may be little consensus about what it is, but there's no shortage of those who claim to know the truth on most university campuses in America today, especially those who claim to know the truth about Western civilization, namely that it's bad, very bad. Indeed, in affirming this and many other claims, most do not deny divine transcendence. On the contrary, many see themselves as upholding transcendent values. Few are thoroughgoing materialists. Many consider themselves spiritual. Most aren't against spirituality. Rather than being irrelig irreligious, American universities today are perhaps more religious than ever before. They are certainly not godless. There are many gods. Yet even among those who don't think Western civilization is all bad and who are more traditionally religious, truth has little, if anything, to do with Jesus Christ. This, of course, isn't new, and I suspect many of you know it's not just the way of many in our universities, it's the way of many in our churches. So it raises the question, when it comes to confessing Jesus Christ as the truth, the way, the way, the truth, and life, what are we doing? What are we asking people to do? Let me be clear. Uh, uh, like Calvin, I, I can't get my head around this. I can't even, I can hardly, I can apprehend it, let alone comprehend what's at stake in all this and all the implications. I've got so much more to learn, but there's, let me share three things I'm learning. Uh, yesterday, I acknowledged that uh, maybe you have learned more about God standing on a seashore or watching a sunset or sitting in a deer stand than you have in church or reading the Bible. Uh, but the question is not where we learn more or less about God, but where we learn the one thing necessary, the truth. You and I may learn all sorts of things about God by all sorts of means, but how would we know that they are true? And what difference would it make unless we know the truth about God, namely, 
that he loves us and sent his son to die for us in order that we might live eternally with him. And to be sure, you and I did not learn that, and we would have never learned that simply by walking on a seashore or watching a sunset or sitting in a deer stand. As wonderful as those experiences are, and I don't want you to dis discourage any of you from doing that. I hope you do that. I'm planning on doing that uh, and, uh, later. But I, the point I tried to make yesterday is that confessing Jesus Christ as the truth, as the way, the truth, and the life, means he is not merely one truth among others. He is the truth by which all others are me measured. Now, I want to go further and say that not only is he not one truth among others, but according to Scripture and our confessions, we do not come to know him as the truth like we come to know other truths. How we come to know him is different. Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Paul said, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. What does this mean? It means apart from Jesus Christ making himself known through his Holy Spirit, we don't know who God truly is. No teaching is more basic in Reformed theology then it takes God to reveal God. For God alone is a fit witness of himself, Calvin says. This is the way of faith seeking understanding. And Calvin defines faith as a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence towards us, founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ, both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad that John emphasized the fact that Calvin feels. He feels, oh, yes, and it's a caricature not to see that. He feels a lot. He does say that the heart distrust is greater, in fact, than the mind's blindness. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. The heart's distrust is greater than the mind's blindness. You see, for Calvin and our tradition, Jesus Christ is, yes, a fact like other facts. But we don't come to know the truth of Jesus Christ like we come to know other truths, other facts. True knowledge of God is not abstract knowledge, as one might deduce from a syllogism or some mathematical equation. Nor is it like picking up a nickel from the sidewalk. It's knowledge that's revealed. What does that mean? Well, what is otherwise hidden to human perception is disclosed by God's free decision. It's not so much something as someone, and not just anyone, it's God. It's personal knowledge yet requires a participation, a participation made possible only by the Holy Spirit. I know talk about the Holy Spirit makes some Presbyterians nervous. Uh, I can see some hold, say, hold on to your wallet. Uh, 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 Presby Presbyterians, uh, the frozen chosen, uh, I, uh, can get pretty nervous about this, and I understand. But there's nothing clearer in Scripture than that the true knowledge of God comes by faith, and faith is a gift. It's a miracle. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does not merely aid our intellect or confirm or authenticate what the mind would otherwise recognize as true if functioning properly and if presented with sufficient evidence. No, it's more than that. The Holy Spirit does more than give a final boost or synapse at the end of a long intellectual struggle for faith. The Holy Spirit does more than provide a supplement or enhance our mental acuity or natural 
brain functioning, sort of like fish oil, what fish oil is supposed to do. No, the Holy Spirit implants a new capacity. We are made a new creation. He doesn't destroy reason, but he redirects it. He doesn't suspend our natural, normal cognitive functioning, but he establishes, Jonathan Edwards says, a new faculty of understanding. A new foundation in the soul is laid. I emphasize this work of the Holy Spirit uh, because it's often been neglected or misunderstood by many, not least by many American Presbyterians. Over the last 200 years, uh, for many, uh, confessing Jesus Christ as the truth has thus been understood more or less as a matter of common sense. We're still trying to recover from this. Uh, as a result, many Christians talk as if they have the truth by the tail or in their pocket. Uh, some think it's so handy they can just whoop it out and use it as a club. But when that happens, the truth of Jesus Christ is misrepresented. So yes, by all means, by all means, be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us and do so with love. But if some don't recognize him as the truth, it may not be because they're irrational. They may be more rational than you and I can imagine. The miracle, the miracle for which there is no substitute and is always beyond our control has simply yet to occur. Jesus Christ is not one truth among others, and we do not come to know him as the truth like we come to know other truths. Yet there are many truths in this world and in the Bible that are worth knowing and acknowledging. So how do we relate these, the truth and the truths? It's a huge question, and I don't know why I ask it, but. Uh, it's, it's the question the church has been wrestling with since founding the first universities, even before. Uh, yeah, a thousand years ago, churches founding universities. The early church fathers wrestled uh, with this question as well, and I can't begin to do justice to it, but let me just describe the basic challenge. Ever since Christians have confessed Jesus Christ as the truth, they've been met by many others who also claim to know the truth. Christians haven't denied, but have by and large affirmed all sorts of truths found elsewhere. I say by, by and large only because there have been among Christians obscurantists, what you might uh, consider today fundamentalists, who have denied truth found elsewhere. But the mainstream of the Christian tradition has affirmed with great energy and enthusiasm all sorts of truths found elsewhere and indeed anywhere. That's why universities were founded in Europe. That's why Jesus' words are engraved on so many colleges throughout this country. country. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That's why Christians have been so committed to liberal arts education. Jesus not only claimed to be the truth, but he said his spirit, his Holy Spirit, would lead us into all truth. The truth of Jesus Christ, the church has recognized, is infinitely rich and multifaceted. He's the Alpha and Omega, after all. The one in whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. Abraham Kuyper expresses this beautifully in a statement many of you know. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Isn't that a beautiful statement? And I don't want to quibble with it, but... <laughs> but I believe it has often been misunderstood because it's often been interpreted in light of a far more popular claim which has functioned as its paraphrase virtually. Namely, all truth is God's truth. How many of you have heard that statement made? Okay. 
I, if there's a more popular claim among American evangelicals in the 20th century, I don't know what it would be. It's often used by evangelicals to disabuse the charge that they are the narrow-minded fundamentalist obscurantists that critics claim. But I, but, and uh, you have heard that and, I, and uh, nevertheless may legitimately ask, well, isn't that so? Isn't it true that all truth is God's truth? What's your problem with this statement? Well, I'm not the first to point this out. Look on the top of page 12 in your packet. In his book, Contending for the Faith, Ralph Wood writes this. All truth is from God remains among Protestants the favorite ungent to grease a multitude of academic sins, ungent, an uh, oily substance. It's, uh, it's been the favorite ungent to grease a multitude of academic sins. This single bromide has poisoned our ability to ask whether there are greater and lesser truths, whether there is a single incarnate truth ordering all other truths and thus whether there are counterfeits to be identified and opposed. Do you see what's at stake here? Yes, all truth is God's truth, but Jesus Christ is not just one truth among others. Yes, the truth, Jesus Christ, is infinitely manifold, manif uh, multifaceted, and is reflected throughout the entire created order, every square inch of it. But Jesus Christ is not just one any kind of truth. And where we come to know him and is, is not arbitrary. Yes, he will lead us by his Holy Spirit into all truth and truths. And we should not hesitate to follow him wherever he leads. But there are many kinds of truths in this world. And knowing all sorts of them may not necessarily lead us back to Jesus Christ. Knowing them may raise all sorts of important questions and even questions about him. But there's no guarantee they will necessarily lead us all back to him, to the truth. Not here and now. The Bible gives us no such promise. Here and now, as Wood says, there is an order of truth. This is what it means to confess Jesus Christ as the truth. It means there is a single incarnate truth ordering all other truths. It means we're to take every thought captive, as Paul says, to this truth. Every thought captive. And when we don't, we risk not only our own confusion, but we risk distorting, even domesticating Jesus Christ, who is the way of, and the truth and the life of God in this world. When Christians have confessed Jesus Christ to be the truth, we've insisted he is a special, unique truth, divine truth, truth of a completely different class, species, and order. Thus, it should come as no surprise that confessing Jesus Christ to be the truth is considered provocative today. It's always been provocative and always will be. And if it's not, then people don't understand or perhaps we don't really understand what we're talking about. Let me give you another reason why it is and always has been considered provocative. When the church has confessed Jesus Christ as the truth and been faithful to Scripture, it has done so always in continuity with Israel, in complete and unequivocal agreement with the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Certainly, this has profound implications for who we are as a people but also profound implications for who God is. To say the Lord is one and Jesus Christ is Lord forced the church to reckon from the get-go 
with what we call the Trinity. And yes, something called the simplicity of God. Namely, there is an integrity, a wholeness, a oneness of God, and the truth, Jesus Christ, who is, who God is, is one. What does it mean to say the Lord is one? It means divine truth cannot be divided up, parceled out, tacked on, or distributed. It cannot be used. It is whole, complete in itself, self-revealing, self-determining, self-authenticating, or it's something else altogether. I wish we had time to discuss this, but it's what the church's greatest theologians have known. And if you want to know more, uh, if you know the source of this statement, it's in your packet. Suffice it to say, divine truth is like no other truth in this world. Of course, I wonder it, uh, if you think any of this really matters, or if you think it has any practical significance, or if it's just vain intellectual, it's a vain intellectual exercise to talk about this. Some sort of head trip with, that has no real bearing on real life. Well, if so, I wonder, I wonder how much you've thought about some of the young people I know. Or I wonder how much you've thought about the only conversation the Bible records of Jesus ever having with a young person. Do you remember Jesus' conversation with the rich young man? He asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus cited the law, and the young man responded, all these things I have kept from my youth. And do you remember what Jesus said? You lack one thing. Yes, Jesus added, go and sell all you have and give it to the poor, which might suggest... His basic problem was that he was a materialist. He was materialistic, and so the lesson for us is not to be. But that's just too easy. It's, uh, it doesn't go deep enough. The Bible doesn't have anything against people having things, and it records no other instance of Jesus telling anyone to sell all they have and give it to the poor. Now, you may think this is a convenient claim to make in Hilton Head Island. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but this is what the Bible says and doesn't say. Yes, this young man had many things. Perhaps many things had him. But the text doesn't portray him as obsessed with things or suggest that he was simply a materialist living on four feet, licking the earth, trying to suck as much juice out of it as he could, can before he dies. That's not what the text suggests. Not at all. What does he want? What he wants eternal life, just as John was saying. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And here's the thing. He's, he thinks there's something he can do. To me, the most disturbing feature of this passage is how moral and virtuous this young man was. His life was about many good things. He was doing many good things. He was keeping the law, the Ten Commandments, which if, you've de if you're determined not simply to break them but to actually fulfill them, will keep you very busy. It takes a lot of time and energy and discipline to fulfill the law. And this is what this young man claims to have done. And the text gives us no reason to doubt his sincerity. Yes, Jesus said to him, nevertheless, you lack one thing. What was it? Before answering, shouldn't we just pause and consider that it was one thing, not many things, a set of things, a laundry list of things? or even what some may call first things? Some of you got it. 
There's another journal called First Things. Okay, you got it. This is the great burden. You see, his life was certainly active and full of many, many good things. He must have been very disciplined. But fulfilling so many righteous demands and obligations, how could he not have felt divided, fragmented by the force of being pulled in so many directions? This is the great burden of living under the law. And we may say, oh, I'm glad we don't live under the law. But isn't that how many of you feel here today? You feel you're being pulled in so many directions by so many demands and obligations. Is this not a problem for you? It is for me. It's not so much waking up in the morning and having to choose between so many bad things. It's choosing between so many good and righteous things. There are so many competing goods vying for our time, attention, energy, and resources. So many righteous demands and obligations. Most pastors I know feel overwhelmed at times, often in fact, because people are continually saying to them, we need to do this, we need to do that, this is important, that's important, and it all usually is. But how does one decide between doing so many good and important things? And pastors, of course, are by no means the only ones forced to decide between so many competing goods. So how do we decide? Augustine, the church's greatest theologian of the first millennium, said we must order our loves. Why must we order our loves? Because we cannot love all things equally, and we do not love all things equally. We love some things more than others. The problem is we're often confused about it. We're not aware of loving one thing more than another. We get confused. Sometimes we think we're loving one thing when we're really loving something else. And I'm not talking about inordinate love. We talked about that, about that yesterday. There are inordinate loves. But I'm talking now about those things, people, and purposes that are worth loving. And let's not kid ourselves by saying, oh, I, love, I just love everybody. No, you don't. <laughs> Or at least that's probably going to be news to many people you claim to love. <laughs> I'm included. Ordering our loves is easier said than done. Most of us say we love or want to love what is good, yet there are so many good things to love. And it is impossible to love all things equally, so we must choose among a multiplicity of goods, which means we must decide not simply what is good, but what is the highest good. And do you remember, do you remember the first thing Jesus said to this rich young man after he addressed him as good teacher? Why do you call me good? Jesus was inviting this young man from the get-go to think more deeply about the good. He invited him to know and to love not simply the highest good, but the source of all good, God himself. This young man was about many good and righteous things. But Jesus said to him, you lack one thing. And it wasn't simply one more thing on a to-do list, nor was it a sense of meaning or purpose or getting some large organizing principle for life. No. It was the one thing necessary. It was the truth. Apart from which we'll never be able rightly to order our lives or our loves. He lacked the way, the truth, and the life of God living in him. He lacked the life-giving, life-transforming spirit of the living God who comes to us through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He is our life, our salvation, our wisdom, our righteousness, our strength, our peace, our joy, our hope, 
It's all in him. And notice, Jesus didn't ask this young man simply to acknowledge this as a fact. Jesus called him to follow him the way. He didn't ask merely for his intellectual assent, but for his life. To, you see, true knowledge of God is active knowledge. It's never merely passive. That's why Calvin says all true knowledge of God is born of obedience. In other words, if we truly know God, we will follow him. But not in order to earn our salvation or make ourselves worthy. No, our salvation is in him alone. He is the one in whom the law has already been fulfilled and who has done everything for us and for our salvation. Thus, for us, it is no longer a matter of striving to earn our salvation by fulfilling the law or making ourselves righteous. It's a matter of joyful obedience to him in whom our salvation has been fulfilled and is complete. Christ alone is our salvation. By grace alone, through faith alone, as told to us through Scripture alone. You know, this is what the Protestant Reformation was about. It was about this one thing. It was about acknowledging this one truth. Each of the solas, I hope you understand this, each of the solas, Christ alone, through grace alone, Scripture alone, through faith, I, uh, the other solas. They were never, all of them, never meant to be understood separately, disparately, but always together, mutually reinforcing, clarifying, and underscoring this one truth. Jesus Christ. And confessing this one truth has always been a challenge. It's always been subject to misunderstanding, always, from the very early on. It's been subject from very early on, both within and without the church. In November of 1962, on the eve of the Second Vatican Council, a reporter from Paris traveled to Basel, Switzerland, to interview Karl Barth whom Pope Pius XII had called the greatest theologian since Thomas Aquinas. The reporter asked Bart, and this is in your packet, page 12. The reporter asked Bart this question. In your opinion, what is the greatest obstacle to rapprochement or dialogue between the evangelical church or the Protestant church and the Catholic church? Bart answered, it is one tiny word that the Roman church adds on, on after each of our propositions. It's the word and. When we say Jesus, the Catholics say Jesus and Mary. We seek to obey only our Lord the Christ. Catholics obey Christ and his vicar on earth, the Pope. We believe that Christians, the Christian is saved by the merits of Jesus Christ. The Catholics add, and by one's own merits. We think that the only source of revelation is Scripture. The Catholics add, and tradition. We say that the knowledge of God is obtained by faith in His Word as it expresses itself in Scripture. The Catholics add, and by reason. In fact, here, Bart said, one hits upon the fundamental problem of the relation between grace and freedom and the salvation of humans. Please understand, the Protestant Reformation was not the discovery, but the rediscovery that we are saved by grace alone, by, by Jesus Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, as told to us through Scripture alone. It was the rediscovery that Jesus Christ is not one truth among others. And we do not come to know him as the truth, like we come to know other truths. And though there are many truths in the Bible and in this world worth acknowledging and recognizing, acknowledging, there is 
an order of truth. And the rediscovery of this order of truth, this singular focus and commitment to Jesus Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, through Scripture alone, changed the world. Please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying Protestants are the only ones who have kept this straight. On the contrary, we haven't. We've often done far worse than others in keeping this straight. And to be sure, there's a lot we can learn from Roman Catholics and from Eastern Orthodox uh, believers and others. But friends, we do have a wonderful heritage that was spoken of yesterday. A powerful intellectual tradition, a remarkably rich number of theological resources that can be of enormous help in helping us keep this focus, this one truth. Jesus Christ, as he's attested for us in Holy Scripture. And I wonder what would happen if we were to rediscover these resources. I wonder what would happen if we were to learn again to confess this one truth and order our lives according to it. I wonder, I wonder what would emerge from all the ecclesiastical rubble that surrounds us, all the spiritual confusion in this world. I wonder. Yet, may I mention one more thing I'm, I'm learning about this one truth. In my senior year in college, I began reading books by the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard. They made a deep impression on me. One was entitled, Purify Your Hearts. It's a commentary on one single verse from the book of James, chapter 4. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The whole book is an exposition of that infinite number of ways one can be double-minded in doing or seeking to do the will of God. Oh, and I remember... I remember saying, oh, you are learning more about yourself than you ever wanted to know, boy. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, I remember that uh, in page after page, Kierkegaard exposed layer after layer of double-mindedness in me. It wasn't what you call a pleasurable read. But it made the point, on the one hand, of what an enormous challenge it is to live a life of single-minded obedience to the truth. And on the other hand, how empty, vain, and frivolous, and superficial life would be not to try. But there's one thing I did not learn from Kierke Kierkegaard. He showed me more clearly than ever before what this means. And I will always be grateful to Kierkegaard. Please don't misunderstand. But there's one thing I did not learn from him. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. Maybe this is what the rich young man didn't get either. It's this. The life Jesus calls us to is not simply about duty, determination, and discipline. We Presbyterians know a little bit about, that, about discipline. Yes, living in single-minded obedience to the truth requires discipline, duty, determination. It requires living according to an order of truth and ordering our loves. But there's more to it than that. There's something else about the truth, about God, the truth about God that we should know. Do you know what it is? It's that the truth about God is Beautiful. The truth about God is not simply a brute fact that we'll all sooner or later be forced to acknowledge. It's not simply a superior power to which we will all sooner or later be forced to yield or bend our knees, to which, to which we will bend our knees. 
The truth about God is more than that. The truth about God is beautiful. It is pleasant. It is desirable. It is attractive. It gives us pleasure and causes us joy. Did you know that our 16th and 17th century Protestant forebearers did not talk much about this? It was not a major theme. They didn't write much about God's beauty. They had their reasons. They were suspicious that the truth of God might be confused with aestheticism. It happens a lot. Oh, preacher, that was a beautiful service. Well, I didn't mean it to be. I meant to tell you the truth. You know. <laughs> Our forebears were right to be cautious. Truth and beauty are not the same and are often confused. And surely the truth about God may not be beautiful like beauty defined elsewhere, but that does not mean the truth about God is not beautiful. The truth is God is beautiful. And that's biblical. Do you remember our call to worship? And we, Jeff mentioned it this morning. One thing I have asked, one thing. I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. How beautiful is the Lord? Jesus put it like this. The, the beauty of the Lord is like this. It's, it's, it's like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, goes and sells all that he has and buys a field, that field. He's like a, it's like a merchant in search of fine, pure pearls who on finding one pearl of great value, one pearl, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is what the rich young man did not know or perhaps could not even imagine, and who among us here does not need to know, understand this better? And let me add this one point that Mark's account of this uh, text mentions. Jesus doesn't simply, in Mark's gospel, ask this rich young man, or doesn't say, you lack one thing. Mark adds this one detail. Jesus, looked, looking at him, loved him. Brothers and sisters, there's no question that following Jesus requires us to reevaluate many things, many good things, and to order our lives, but it is all for the sake of the one who brings us joy and whose be beauty is true and never fades and whose love never ends. This is the good news of the gospel. And it's for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, will you open our hearts and our minds to the infinite and inexhaustible beauty of your truth and help us to cause you joy. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.